Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Cricket Judge podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of having one of the most successful cricketers of the women's international game. She's the first cricketer ever to play 100 T20 international. She's a World Cup winner, an Ashes winner, and she received an MBE in 2013 for her contribution to cricket. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Jenny Gunn. Welcome to the show, Jenny. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Pleasure. Plan for Christmas going coming along well? Um, it's strange. So I'm not normally in this country for Christmas. So, um, ah, yeah, it's a bit cold. Boring. It's a bit of a shock to the system. But, um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Sure. So, just wanted to ask you, so when you were younger, um, what inspired you to play cricket? Because it's only recently we've had this massive surge of the women's international game. So what was it that inspired you? Um, it's quite strange. So I wanted to play football, really. Okay. Um, my dad played professional football. I wanted to be like, following his footsteps. And um, I played as a kid, so kind of tried to go down that route. But um, my dad played cricket in the, in the summer, so... I'd go down and watch with one of the kids, just play cricket, play any sport really. Just It was just nice to be outside until they, one day they were, they were short, basically. Mm-hmm. So they said, oh, do you want a field? I was like, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. And I, I remember throwing uh, the ball in from a boundary. No one expected a girl to be able to throw. So um, I ran this guy mm-hmm. out and it was, it was a really nice feeling getting um, a man out, really. So then I was like, oh, I, I sort of want to pick it up a bit more, want to bowl, I want to try batting. And kind of went from there and then ended up just playing uh, with my dad and my brother uh, most weeks, really. And kind of got, got the bug for it and, and tried to play football and cricket um, side by side, really, for quite a few years. So I hear that your father actually won the European Cup with Nottingham Forest and he played under Brian Clough. Firstly, yeah. did you ever meet Brian Clough? No, I just hear all the stories, um, which is quite entertaining. So, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool having a dad who won the European Cup and um, they, all, they all still catch up now and they're all, like, all lovely. It's just these players who have done amazing things and they're just so down to earth and they all, most of them, played cricket as well. So... Um, yeah, I think Cluffy encouraged him to play cricket. So that was, that was really nice. And I think that's where my football cricket sort of came from, really. So when you were first starting off, was there many local female cricket teams? There were too many. Uh, when I was, so I started playing a bit later than um, a lot of the girls now. So I was 12, 13 when I was going into just um, county age groups stuff really so I, I always had to play men's cricket which I, I don't think was a bad thing so it, it really made my competitive side come out of me because uh, I had to I had to hold my own otherwise you just get the stick taken out of you but there was a, a local side in Nottingham called Thrumpton mm-hmm. um, and that was my first club I went to uh, ladies only but I was so lucky because at the time I think there was five England players playing there so straight away I was these are players I look up, looked up to so it was like Jane Smith, Kate Lowe um, Nikki Shaw, Dawn Holden, Lucy Pierce, and these people who I, I've seen on TV um, just when I was just starting to fall in love with cricket and I'm, I've got the chance at 13 to play with them. So very, very fortunate to, to play at such a high standard club uh, as my first club. But I, th- I mean, nowadays there's probably not too many uh, women's clubs in Nottingham, which is a, a real shame. Uh, I've, I've just started coaching at Plumtree uh, down the road from where I am in Nottingham. So we're starting um, very youngsters, but hopefully we can push on and, and get women's cricket going again in Nottingham. So growing up, who was your role model in cricket? Yeah, it's, it's a strange one because I always probably looked to the Australians. So to me, it was Glenn McGrath. Mm-hmm. wasn't really quick bowler but just on the spot every every ball was just there and thereabouts and off stump and just how successful he was just from from being accurate really and and it just shows I think to to anyone really wanting to play cricket that you don't have to have you don't have to have the, the speed you don't have to bowl 100 miles an hour you don't have to hit the ball out of the ground and things it's just actually the more accurate you are the more successful you can be so I looked up to him um and he was probably at the top of the game when I was a, a youngster. So he was, he was always on TV to watch. 
Yeah, he's, he dominated cricket for about 20 odd years, didn't he? So whenever he played against England, I used to genuinely uh, be so fearful. I, was like, I knew it was almost game, and like 99% you probably lost. <laughs> so yeah, he was a, an excellent role model, so disciplined. Oh, well, I think that's when, when he slipped on that ball, I think everyone was like quite happy. Yeah, relieved. Got him out, yeah. Yeah, he just changed the whole series, basically. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So you made your first-class debut for Nottinghamshire in 2001. Do you remember your first first class game? Uh, a long time ago now. Um, I remember because it was it was it's adults, so I was just a, a kid at the time. So I was quite shocked I got a call up and and to to be around so many. So there was loads of England players at this competition. So it was a tournament uh, in Cambridge, and so it was. It was it was. I was in awe of all these people, but actually you're a kid have fun why like they've invited you there so I just tried to enjoy it and not put not I didn't put too much pressure on myself and actually it was probably a, a, such an experience and, and one that's probably helped me go on to uh, be successful just because I got to experience that that at a young age. So in 2004 you got called up for England this is for the ODIs against South Africa when you did get called up how did you feel about it? First of all, I thought someone was joking because I, mm-hmm. I was just on the way to college and someone rang me up saying, you've been picked, do you want to come to, us, to South Africa? And I was like, well, who wouldn't, but who are you? And I found out it was the selectors and it was, I mean, it was a shame because one of the seam bowlers got injured. So I was an injury call up, but you've got, to, you've got to take your chance somewhere. Mm-hmm. And, and um, yeah, at 17, I, I was on that plane to, to South Africa and yeah, to be, to be fair, before I know it, because I thought I was going to be running drinks all up, all tour. And next thing, I'm just at the top of my run up, opening the bowling for England, which is just unbelievable. Didn't think I'd ever do it. Um, and yeah, it was just a bit of a blur because I was just, it happened quite quickly for me as well. Um, but yeah, you never, you never forget. Um, I think running out, putting your first England shirt on, and, and it's something to be proud of. And, and I'll be proud of that for forever yeah so during your debut um do you remember your first wicket i think it was pillory the Mm. keeper for south africa at the time um but i just literally i just i don't even know how i got her out but literally i just remember it was the first wicket and it's like thank you like you can just relax now it's sort of uh, the first one and, and I think that's probably why they made me open the bowling because I had the ball in my hand straight away so there was no choice I just had to run in and bowl rather than literally panicking when am I going to bowl um, and probably get more, more nervous so the nerve settled quite quickly once I knew my role open the bowling and um, yeah once you get that first wicket it was just everything just calmed down. So during that se- uh, during your debut, you were 17 years old at the time, and there was a few issues that the umpires raised about your actions. So I was just wondering if you could tell us about what happened there. Yeah, so I've, I've I mean I've still got a dodgy action now, so I'm I'm very hypermobile, um, and my wrist comes over and it flicks, so it looks from different angles it looks a bit dodgy. Um, I mean, I still get called now Chucky uh, for throwing, but um, yeah, so I've, I've just literally played my first game for England. So, so happy, uh, relief, Go, gone off the field, sat down, just trying to take it all in. And then my captain's come over and said, oh, we need you in the umpire's room. I was like, what have I done wrong? Like, you just want to chill out. Mm. And basically the umpire said, we think you throw it. So I'm literally 17 years old, away from home, debut, and the umpires aren't happy. So I was like, this is a different world, what is happening? Um, so they just weren't happy with my action, so I had to get tested. I mean, 15 degrees, you have to be over. I'm seven, so I'm nowhere near, near even throwing it. <laughs> and um, I got tested, and still people didn't believe, believe it back then, but I, I got cleared and was allowed to bowl um, until a few years later when it came up again that I was... They just don't. They just don't believe me. I was like, I don't know what I can do. It's just my action. See, I've seen you bowl on television, and you've definitely got a very unique action. But I never ever thought that you're you're a chucker or you threw it ever. No, it is. It's weird because rather than loading in front, I come out. Mm-hmm. So then it goes all the way around, and yeah. 
I, it, I hate seeing my action in slow motion because it's disgusting how how far my arm bends. But um, yeah, I've had some really interesting um, times over the years in India. The umpire wouldn't even let me bowl. I bowled one ball and he said, "You throw it, don't bowl." I was like, "Well, I don't know." And to to the point where um, the guys at Loughborough they wrote a journal on my action. Okay. all these figures and stuff and it was ridiculous or but it's just to prove i don't throw it super slow motion yeah. and so umpires if we go to them before the game and said this is my action mm-hmm. and they're fine but some of the umpires wouldn't even watch it and then i'm like well you why are you calling me then if you don't even want to yeah um and so yeah it's been frustrating at, at times because people in the crowd shout no ball um and all this i was like I don't know what I can do to to prove I don't throw it, but it's all part of it. Yeah, certainly is because there's a there's a lot of other actions like in the men's game in particular. Um, you got like Shoei back to back, you know. Yeah. And then you had uh, Bully, obviously. He he's basically changed the game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I would understand if I bowled like rapid. I don't. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. very medium pace, mm-hmm. or if I got loads of wickets, but I don't. So it's just really weird how. I've just over the years I've just gone through so much like rubbish over an action which I like I say I'm nowhere near it's just different. Mm-hmm. Well you had a very successful career so you don't, don't need to be too humble. <laughs> 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 but um so at the time do you know once did you when they uh, raised concerns about your your action did you do anything to change it? Yeah, so at that time, um, I, was a, I was the first female on the Knotts Academy, mm-hmm. which was a great experience. And um, I would literally run up and down a wall. So my wall, a wall was on my right-hand side. And so literally my arm couldn't come out. So it had to be in here mm-hmm. and go straight back. But when the wall wasn't there, it just straight comes back out. It's just, I did so much work for it. And to be fair, when I first started, I used to, um, away, I used to hoop away a lot. And then through my actions sort of changing um, slightly over the years, I'm very over now and sort of angle it in. So, um, which isn't a bad thing as well, because I think attacking the stumps is better for my game at my pace. But um, yeah, I, I, I did try to change it. But actually, looking back now, I don't, I didn't have to change it because mm-hmm. I did nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's just more to quiet, like shut people up really. But Actually, I probably should have been a bit stronger and said no. As you're now a coach as well, so you're involved in coaching, and you're obviously having a very unique action, has that had any sort of impact in your coaching career thus far? Yeah, I mean, it's very early days, but I think, I think it's a way of coaching now is actually, unless a bowler is going to get injured from their action, like let them. And I think a prime example is all the times we've gone to the subcontinent, all these kids coming into ball, they've got different balls and everything. I'm just like, and that's them just having to play around with what works for them. And why, I think back in the day, we changed things too quickly. I think let them play, let them figure it out for themselves. Like I say, if it's working for them, they're doing something right. And it's different. You don't want you don't want robots. You don't want everybody's action the same, and and it won't work. Like I can't bowl like Brett Lee. I can't. But my body will not get in that um, how he bowls. I can't brace my front leg like him. Like no one can. It's just let them figure out what they what is best for them. Like I say, unless they're going to get injured, if it works, like let them go. Fully agree. Like in India at the moment, we've got Jaspreet Bumrah who's got a very, very unique action. And I, re- I remember when he first started and when the commentators were analysing his action and it, like logic just basically states that he's destined to have, be injury prone. Yet, yeah. you know, he's had a very successful career in the IPL and international, so it does work. So I fully agree with what you're saying. Well, he's probably bowled like that since he was a kid, though, so mm-hmm. his body's got strong to be in that. Like Malinga, who mm-hmm. no one else can bowl from there, but he's... He's so successful. And it's just, I, I think coaches are going away now. No, let them. Fully agree. And, uh, and that's definitely the right way to go about it, especially with all these different formats of the game now. Yeah. So when you made your international debut and you, were playing, you started playing international cricket, you were a teenager. So how did you cope with the pressure of playing for England starting off at the age of 17? Yeah, I think... 
it helps coming from a really sporting family. I think like, watching, growing, watching my dad play football and all his friends and stuff, just how down to earth they are. And all the, I think I was always taught if you put all the hard work in, in the training, the fun part is playing games. So actually you want to be out there. You don't want to be watching. You don't want to sit on the sidelines. So if you put all the hard work in, it's just the game is slightly easier because you can have fun. So like I say as well, playing men's cricket, I think that really helped. Um, you just have to, you have to just hold your own. And so I learned, yeah, quickly. It's not, you might not have your own way all the time, but if you put your fight and you do your best, that's all, all you can ask for. And again, my family never put any pressure on me. So actually it was so much fun and, and yeah, it, it still makes me smile now thinking about all them, the times I actually pulled on England shirt and had fun. And it literally, I feel like I've blinked and my career's over and that's 15 years. So actually enjoy the, the times you have when you're playing because it does, it just goes too quickly. Oh, it certainly does. So like, there was an Ashes, men's, men's and women's Ashes series in 2005. And again, I remember that men's Ashes series in particular 15 years ago. I can't believe it's been 15 years. It's on Sky almost like every day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And the women's Ashes is structured differently to the men's Ashes. And even though I love the game and I follow all aspects of cricket, I sometimes find it a bit confusing about how women's Ashes is structured because it's a point system. So I just wonder if you can explain yeah. how it works. Yeah, so the first... So 05 was the same so as uh, the men though, so that was just, we had three test matches. Whereas now, because we don't play so many test matches, which is a shame, um, it's on a point system because otherwise whoever holds the Ashes can literally just block out for four days. Um, that's our, so our test match is four days. And you could just block it out and it, there wasn't really going to be a result. So you want people to come and watch mm -hmm. women's cricket. So um, the point system came in. So... It was two points. If you win an ODR, you get two points. Um, one point for a 2020. And I think it was three for a test match if you win it. Mm -hmm. And if you draw, the points are just shared. So over the whole series, it, it keeps it alive mm -hmm. rather than just like one of the teams just literally walk it and then it's like it's dead rubbers. Um, so I think the point system really worked and um, they're starting to bring it in, into men's cricket now to, to really it just keeps it more exciting. Um, and really, they want bums on seats, don't they? They want people in the stadiums um, watching. So it does. It, it keeps it. It keeps it alive. I agree, and I think it's a brilliant initiative taken by the cricketing board to kind of um, make cricket in the women's game more appealing for the fans. Because obviously, if Test cricket wasn't in demand. Because even right now, the men's cricket Test matches, England, it's fine, and Australia, it's fine. But even in India, India. The T20s and uh, ODIs are always packed, but test matches are 50, you know, about 50, 60 percent full yeah. capacity. So it's yeah. good that, you know, these, these uh, cricketing boards are taking all of this into account. For, so for sure. So how did it feel playing Ashes cricket? So when you made your debut in Ashes, in the Ashes? I think if you talk to everybody, everyone, everybody wants to play a test match. That's what I think every cricketer has been brought up on, wanting to play red ball cricket. Um, and in an Ashes test, who doesn't want to play against Australia? And and for us, that's when England were the women's side. We were just changing. We had um, a few of the older players were retiring, so we had quite a few um, young ones coming in. So there was myself, Lady Greenway, Ishigua, and um, a few others. So a few things were changing, but we actually didn't know all the history about England and Australia. Like we knew it, but we didn't know we hadn't won a Test match for forty-three years. Like oh wow, even, okay. yeah. So you just don't expect that. So all these youngsters are just going in, just wanting to do their best because it's a, a, one of our first tastes of um, playing against Australia. And and so yeah, when we actually beat them, we found out that we haven't beaten them in forty-three years, and it was just crazy looking back on old like scorecards when the Aussies would just literally bat us out of the game and then bowl us out and literally they only battered once all the time. So um, to get one over on, on them, it was just an amazing feeling. And I think it was the start of um, changing cricket in England, really. Do you remember your first Ashes test wicket? I want to... Uh, do you know? 
I don't, unfortunately. I would say, I could say it's either Belinda Clark or, or Lisa Kitely. Because mm-hmm. I got Belinda Clark, who was one of the greatest Australians of all time. I got her for a pair um, in that test match, which I think it was the last test match. So um, that was pretty um, special to get such a good player out. So. so that series, how much of an impact do you think it had on the women's game? Yeah, it was massive. I think if, if the men hadn't have done like, so well as well, mm-hmm. I don't think we wouldn't have had anything. Um, like people would have yeah we've won but nothing would have happened so much so I think for both England sides to win um, that really kicked on cricket for everybody in England so I think that like I said that was the start of people taking us seriously as well so as soon as you beat Australia you're literally on the map aren't you so um, ECB pumped a lot more funding in and and yeah we went we we went more professional than we ever have done before so in that in two thousand and five, did you actually keep up with the men's Ashes series? Yeah, I think everyone was always just um, keeping an eye on. And I mean, what a series it was! Like like you said, it's always on on TV now. You still get goosebumps, even though you know what's coming. It's still so good to watch. See, I find it so difficult watching that um, that Test match when Australia needed two or three runs to win, yeah. and then Brett Lee. I think it was Michael Kasprovitz. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even though obviously I wanted England to win, but I'm just like, oh my god, like what? Is no, I can't believe drama. what I wanted to win. It's so much drama. It's <laughs> mad. So, um, who do you say is your favourite men's cricketer ever? Uh, probably Andrew Simons. Andrew Simons. Okay. Any particular reason? I just think because he he could bat, bowl, and, and field, and he could change a game um, in all three aspects. And I think that's the way cricket has gone now. Um, like you just ha- you have to be in the game all the time and I think he was a, one of the first true all-rounders that he can have an impact and and literally make something happen from nothing I mean he bowled a seam and off spin like whatever you want me to do I'll do so um, and like, his fielding was just ridiculous as well so and he is English yes it's a shame yeah. that we missed out on him <laughs> I know, don't know yeah. what happened there because <laughs> he's playing no, for him. Mm, yes. how unfortunate what about who's your favourite female cricketer of all time? That's a great question. Cause it was weird, cause, like I said, growing up, I didn't really mm-hmm. have many. Mm-hmm. Um, but I probably, I was very fortunate, fortunate to play with her and call her a friend, Jane Smith. So mm-hmm. she probably put me under her wing, uh, played with her at, at Knotts mm-hmm. uh, for years and got the chance to play with her at England. So really, I've probably got a lot to, to thank her for that she yeah. showed me the ropes and probably got me up to speed with uh, what it takes to be an international cricketer and trying to keep up with fitness with her. She was a hockey player as well, so super, super fit. So, um, yeah, I'd have to probably say Jane. Excellent. So moving a few years forward, in 2009, you suffered a few injuries which resulted in you missing the World Cup final in Sydney. So what sort of injuries did you suffer there? It wasn't, I mean, I've, I've had a few like stress fractures in my mm-hmm. back, but it was, it was more annoying that it was my um, calf. Um, oh, okay, I see. And it's something of, it was, do you know, it's something of nothing. I'd rather it go like properly, but it was um, just a, a mild calf strain, which I got in a game before and I, I did everything possible. So I was on the team sheet for the final mm-hmm. um, and had a fitness test on the morning. And I was just like, oh, I just can't do it. And in the end, I ended up putting myself out. I just couldn't let the team down. Um, if I couldn't bowl my 10 overs, I, j- I just couldn't live with it. Or if like, I was chasing a ball and my calf would go and we lose by like, one run, it's my fault. I just I couldn't do it. So I said, no, I can't do it. And Nicky Shaw came in and um, got player of a match. So it wasn't all, all bad. Yeah, but um, bad. Yeah. yeah, it's not, not the worst <laughs> thing that could happen. But you did experience, experience some success in that year because you guys won the T20 World Cup. At Lords. So tell me about that game and how did you do? Yeah, um, yeah I, was, I was actually out in the, I was batting with uh, Claire Taylor when she hit the winning run. So that was, um, that was nice. And also in England. So um, that was a, a really special moment winning at Lords. So um, yeah, that, I mean, that was, it feels like a whirlwind tournament now. Um, like a long time ago, a lot's happened since then. But I think again, that was, it just showed how 
2005, winning the Ashes, it helped us improve. Um, the training was better. And and then I think the next thing was to win a, a world title. So mm-hmm. um, that was really, it was probably, again, changed, changed us um, and even took us more seriously because we could play the new format as well. So in 2013, you were the vice captain of England. You won the Ashes that year, which resulted in you receiving an MBE. So tell us about that experience. Yeah, it was, I won, again, something I didn't even, even expect. Um, and so still, it's still strange now thinking I was, I was vice captain. But I think it was just more, I, people can talk to me. So as a vice captain, I think that's really good that I'm approachable. So um, that really helped. But yeah, I mean, I was I was scared when um, Charlotte Edwards got injured and I ended up being captain. So that was a bit of a oh wow um, go on then. So I think I've captained my country three times. Um, so yeah, that was that was that was pretty that unreal, which you, I really didn't expect to ever captain my country. And, and um, but to win that was that was really good. And I remember one game, uh, Nat Siver. Um, took a hat trick and I, I was captain and got a FIFA, but she got player of a match for getting a hat trick. I was like, oh, a FIFA. But yeah. I was like, I'm just, I was just glad, glad we won, really. And uh, like I say, as captain, it was just nice to actually win the game. So. so, in relation to your MBE for winning that series, who actually informed you that you're receiving this award? I just got, a, I wasn't even home at the time. So I got a letter and it was to my mum and dad's house. And mum says, oh, you've got a fancy letter. And um, so she opened it and, and she was so excited and, and she can't tell anyone either. So straight away, they're trying to, my family are trying to plan who's going um, to Buckingham Palace with me. I was like, well, I get to pick. Mm-hmm. And but how do you pick like who goes with you when your family have helped you get to where you are and and things so I was so happy when I heard there was three people so I could actually take mum dad and my grandma um which was that's just it's probably one of the best things I've I could do um to thank them is to take them um to Buckingham Palace for the day. Do you recall which member royal member of the royal family gave you the award and what they yeah. if you said anything? No so it was Princess Anne um who so i was lucky i met the queen in 2005 when we won the ashes so it was, it was cool to meet someone else as well so princess anne as well loves her sport so she just spoke about um well done and and winning uh previously and, and i mean you only get 10 seconds with her but uh for me i was so scared because i was wearing high heels and you have to walk forward curtsy and walk backwards so i was so so nervous that all these people behind there's like thousands of people please don't fall over on camera and make a fool of yourself but um yeah it was a, it was a very special day and um yeah one that i'll always remember princess and definitely um, obviously i've never met any of the royal family but she's definitely one of the more entertaining and charismatic members of the royal family She's not shy to speak her mind, of course. But I think she just seems down to earth. Yes, of course. So, moving forward a few years from that, you won the World Cup in 2007. So tell me about your experiences during that tournament. In 17, sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, you want to play in a, in a World Cup in your own country. Uh, and to win... The, in 09 in Australia was brilliant because it's in Australia obviously it's amazing but uh, women's cricket came on so much in that time so we, we wanted to to compete and we're, we're professional athletes now so mm-hmm. um, you, you're expected to, to perform so there's that much pre- there's a bit more pressure on you especially being um, in your own country but for me and I think probably all the girls it meant all our families can come um, and again like I said we're we were only playing cricket because of people who've gone before us and or helped us. So to actually play in front of people we care about, that, that meant so much. And to me, I probably knew it was probably going to be my last World Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, the third, at the start of a tournament, I didn't really expect to be playing too much. Just kind of, there might be team rotation. But then Lauren Winfield um, broke a hand, actually, um, which gave me my chance Um and actually I felt really good. I, I felt uh, a bold well in that tournament and 
uh, with Catherine Brunt, we've got myself and her got us out of trouble batting in a few occasions, uh, particularly against Australia, which was again always nice. But I think my favourite game was probably the South Africa semi-final game mm-hmm. um, when we were really we we just showed that we came back to eleven and we had to dig deep. But actually, we stayed. Well, I was calm out there. I think people on the balcony they they were um, making me a little bit nervous by their faces at times, but. We all had we all had faith that we can we can get over the line from from anywhere. I think that's a sign of a, a good team, and, and we did. So from the beginning of the tournament, were you confident that you had a really good chance of winning the World Cup? Yeah, I think it was probably one of the best team fields we had. Um, we we we've done all the hard work. Uh, we had some really good performances going into it, so uh, we knew just each other's roles we knew what we we had to do we had plans for everything so um what to do when and yeah things didn't go well the first game against India when we lost at, at Derby but I think that's probably the the kick up the the, the you ask you really need yeah. needed. and um actually no come on yeah we, we've got these plans what we need to we need to do it and I think that's what made it even more special is to beat India in the final it just showed we beat every single team in that tournament so I think we deserve to be world champions for that tournament. Excellent. So nowadays, you're talking about how women has become, women's cricket has become more and more professional and has been taken a lot more seriously by everyone and it's getting a lot more exposure. So now the cricketers have central contracts, but you were one of the original 18 in 2014 to receive a central contract. So how important do you think this is and why? Yeah, I mean, it was it was important in 2004. Like, we were trying to fit everything in. And, um, yeah, I mean, we've got the best job in the world. We get to travel the world and, and things. But, yeah, we're trying to fit in all the training, cricket. And we were working back then as well. So we were trying to fit stuff in. And it was challenging, but we did it because we really enjoyed it. So to get a professional contract was actually, um, again, out of this world. So I thought I'd retire and then they would come in. So... To experience it was was pr- pretty special and it's only gone from strength to strength but I reckon before we got that contract we were training profession- professionally without money um, so actually to get it was it was a nice reward but it's improved even more so they've just brought in um, contracts for domestic cricket now as well so they're trying to get in more in line with Australia who are leading leading the way with women's cricket at the moment because uh, they've got so many women and girls on on contracts, which you can see by how good they are, it does bring the standard up. So um, it is improving, and I think now next year with the hundred as well, you'll get more more people playing. That's what you want. You want you want a bigger pool to choose pool to choose from. You want people to stand up, and with these contracts, they can train um, like pretty much full time on good grounds as well. Because I think that's the difference as well that you can't bowl a bad ball because you'll get punished for it. So um, you know what to expect when you actually do make it to England, that you're not just thrown in the deep end and thinking, oh, I'm not ready for this. Everybody's ready because they've got that cricket behind them. So before you were given a central contract, as well as playing cricket for England, were you doing, were you working in a different field to support yourself at the time? Yeah, so I was, I was fortunate to work for um, Chance to Shine. Um, which was it was so good to work for them and actually get to coach so we've tried we, I think we've actually done it now we've taken rounders out of curriculum in most schools and we're playing uh, cricket now which is really good for especially for women's cricket um, but yeah so we, we were up and down the country and I think that's what probably was challenging at times that we were driving to Plymouth which is not around the corner from Nottingham um, and some days we're in Brighton and coming back and trying to fit training in but it wasn't like we were training at nine o'clock at night just trying to fit stuff in. But you do it because you want to play cricket for England and, and that was the sacrifices you've got to make. And like I say, it, I wouldn't have changed anything. I'd, I had the best job in the world for 15 years. And um, yeah, I've missed, missed out on things. And um, I mean, I missed my sister's wedding. I had a cardboard cutout put up um, instead just, um, just so I could be there. Uh, which now lives in my grandma's front window. So um, to scare people off from parking on outside a mm-hmm. drive. But um, yeah, you just got to do it. And I, I was lucky that my family supported me uh, 100%. So 
yeah, very lucky. I can definitely appreciate the creativity of that cardboard cutout at the <laughs> wedding. That's excellent. I'm going to yeah, have to I, think about it. I had to get dressed up and everything. Mm-hmm. So go somewhere nice, but um, the height was good as well. It was a five foot ten cardboard cutout. So excellent. Yeah, it was, it was excellent. Yeah. A few inches here. Excellent. <laughs> so, what do you think now? Obviously, the game is moving forward really fast. What do you think the cricket administrators need to do to increase the brand of the female game? Yeah, I think we saw it this summer. So um, it was on free to air TV. So BBC um, put games on. And I think you just get a new audience there because people just flicking over the channel. Oh, let's watch this for a little bit. So um, that that was massive uh, turning point, in, especially in the women's game. Uh, I mean, the men's cricket as well, that was that was for the first time in years, wasn't it? That was on as well, free to air. So uh, I've heard that that will happen next year as well in, in the summer. So going forward, I really hope that um, puts a push on, on cricket, but then also it puts pressure on the players because you really want to perform then because there's there's a whole new audience that you, you're trying to capture there. Agreed. And it is definitely the way forward. So... In terms of, you, you mentioned earlier that it's a shame that the ladies game, they don't play many test matches. Is it just due to a lack of demand or is it not putting bombs on seats? What, what do you think it is? So, first of all, I think it's um, of a cricketing board. So Australia have got money. So we could, so when you put a test match on, on to the end of a tour, it's, it's seven to 10 days. So that's mm. money. Um, whereas Australia and we could have paid, but some some countries just could not afford it um and also back at the start a lot of people had jobs so they couldn't they couldn't just go for another two weeks because it's just it wasn't viable whereas now i think a lot more women, women want to play test cricket and i think it is getting bums on seats in a way um and because we don't play two-day cricket we don't play three day we, there's n- basically we just get thrown into a test match and mm-hmm. that's the only way so um It'll be interesting in the future if like counties do start to play two day cricket games just to try and get used to playing more like longer formats so people get used to bowling them overs because I know my body wasn't used to bowling like twenty, twenty five overs a day and it is a is a massive shock to the system and fair play to all the men's test ma- test players who literally go back to back test matches. It is just crazy, but we all want to do it. So it will be really interesting in the future if, if we get more. Yes, fully agree. And you talk about workloads and one of the people's workloads who I was always fascinated with and amazed with was Murli. I don't know if you watched no. many of Sri Lankan's t- uh, matches back in the day. It'd be like 60 overs of Murli and 20 overs of whoever else, you know, was bo- yeah. in that bowling lineup. It's amazing, it is- Crazy, he could bowl like I mean, he was just ridiculous. And yeah, it's mental. What format do you actually prefer? Do you prefer test matches, ODIs, or T20s? I I really enjoyed um, test matches. I think it was you just find out who who the best are, really, because it just your mental side of it is it does it takes everything, and then to get up and go the next day, um, because it is, it's it's that's what test cricket is, it's a test. Um, so that that was good, but I do enjoy fifty over. I don't want to bowl in twenty twenty. I like batting in twenty twenty, but um, but it is also nice to chop and change as well to have these formats. So um, uh, I think we were lucky in the women's games to to play all all three um, in our tours as well. So who do you say is the best cricketer you played with? Play, Nat Siver. Nat Siver. She's you, ridiculous. Yeah. And who do you say is your toughest competitor? <laughs> um, who I've played with or anybody. To be fair, it would be anybody, Catherine Brunt. Anybody, anybody. Catherine, Catherine Brunt, who, mm-hmm. um, yeah, fiery uh, mm-hmm. Yorkshire lass. And um, soft, soft, one of the softest people you'll meet on the field, but white line fever and just will not back down in anything. And I, re- I mean, I remember doing the yo-yo fitness test and she didn't want to lose. Um, and she was literally practically throwing up on the line. The beat went, and she did more shuttles. And it just it just takes something like what mental strength she has to to be able to do that. 
um, and just 100% constantly. She's still playing, isn't she? Yeah, she's definitely still playing. I know she was in the Big Bash. And she is, I think she's probably one of the quickest fem- uh, bowlers in the uh, ladies' game. Am I correct? Yeah, and she's only yeah. like five foot four. I'll give yeah. her an extra inch, yeah. Five foot four. So she, she is small, but she's just so strong. And, yeah. and I guess that goes back to when I said you don't, you don't need the, like you don't have to be six foot six or whatever. She's actually just become really strong mm-hmm. um, and powerful. And it's, it's got her um, to bowl quicker, really. What would you say is your favourite experience in cricket? Um, I, I mean, I, travelling the world is just amazing and to go to countries that I would never have dreamed of. So um, I got to go to Bangladesh, which was just ridiculous because they just love... To be fair, Bangladesh, India and Sri Lanka are amazing countries to go to because people are so friendly and everybody just loves cricket. No matter what, the sun comes up, you're playing cricket no matter where. And I remember went to, um, in Sri Lanka, we were walking down the road. These kids couldn't speak English, but they were playing on a railway track next to it, playing cricket. And we started chucking a ball. We chucked a ball back and they just kind of summoned us as come over and we played cricket with them. And it was just like to see smiles on their faces. We couldn't speak to each other, but you could communicate through cricket. And that was, that was an experience that I'll always remember. And, and if I didn't play for England, I would never get to do those sort of things. So that, that was pretty special. Yeah, that sounds very inspiring and special, certainly. Um, who do you say is the greatest cricketer of all time, male or female? That is a great question, isn't it, now? Mm-hmm. Um, that is a good question. I'd, well, I mean, you've probably got to say, like, Don Bradman or someone, haven't you? Just, like... <laughs> his records yes are just ridiculous yeah I fully agree I think I've never seen him play but to average 99 oh. and in first class cricket his average was 94 and he played like two, 300 games so you know he was the real deal I would just love to see him play now do you know with the bats they have it's just it'd be, oh, I wonder like it would be so and on um on the pitches they play because they like uncovered pitches mm-hmm. no helmet and they're just scoring all these runs still it's just like fair play to him yes fully agree and I was watching a documentary on him not so long ago and they were saying that he used to practice with a wicket and a ball against a wicket ball, ball, isn't it? Yeah. just for, yeah. to improve his hand-eye coordination so he definitely yeah it would be interesting to see. His average would probably be about 200 now. <laughs> well, yeah, easy. <laughs> Won't get him out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So who is the fastest bowler you've ever faced? Yeah. Um, Catherine Fitzpatrick, who was an Australian, who was scary, very scary. But um, she had the Brett Lee, Lee action, so it was just like a perfect action. And um, she wasn't shy of giving you a few words either. Um, so that, that she only played, when I was starting, she was just sort of finishing. So, um, yeah, but just always in your face and always got something to say. Um, and sometimes you dread hitting her for four because, like, you know, the next one's going to be, like, through here. Um, but, yeah, she was pretty sharp. So between you and your father, obviously you've both had very successful sporting careers. Who do you say has been the more successful sports person? Yeah, we we have this a lot. And I mean, I joke because as a kid, I said I want to put a World Cup next to my dad's European Cup medal. And um, I joke now that I've got three to his one. But um, but no, like I say, he, he played 10 years professional at Forest. So um, he had a very successful career in that. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I would always say my dad and my dad would always say me. So I don't think you're going to ever get a, a definite answer from us. But Again, I think I've been successful thanks to my dad. So we don't appreciate any diplomacy on this interview. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Just yeah, that's fine. So, what are your plans for the future, then, Jenny? Yeah, I, I'm trying to um, go to Australia. Uh, I'd, I'd like to live out there. Uh, I went there last winter. I did a bit of coaching with Cricket New South Wales and, and Sydney Cricket Club. So I, I played for Sydney mm-hmm. probably about 10 years ago, 10, mm-hmm. 11 years ago. So um, I went back and some of the girls were still there, uh, just helping out the youngsters. And then at Christmas, they were short. So I ended up having to play, which I, 
I'd retired by this point officially um, and I'd had no kit so I turned up I felt like under 11s again I turned up no whites no kit or anything so I'm borrowing kit so I'm borrowing Alyssa's Healy Healy's bat I was like this is all right pinged off um, somehow I got 100 this bat I was like I might have scored more runs if I had a good bat and then that was it so I was stuck playing cricket for all winter mm. and actually I think that's that was me out of retirement and got me back playing cricket really thanks to being in Australia but um, yeah it was, it's just the coaching side of it and sometimes I feel when I'm on the field playing it's easier to help um, at times and, and, and help with the experience and keep people calm and actually just get them because people often know what they want to do but actually asking them the right question to get them to do it is um and like you can't do it as a coach off the field so actually while I can still play and hold my own um it's kind of helping a different way of coaching but um it's it's working at the moment and before we conclude, Jenny, I would like to ask you your best 1-11 to 11 cricketers you've played with or against. Yeah, it's my notes here, right. So there might be 14 here. I don't know how many. But um, I had Alyssa Healy. Mm-hmm. There's going to be loads of Australians here. Alyssa Healy. Um, Karen Rolton was a um, left-handed Australian who, um, if, if you gave her throwdowns and you weren't good enough, she would not, she would just tell you, say, no, go and get somebody else in. And mm. she was like Don, Don Bradman, just hit balls after ball after ball, but ridiculous skills. Um, and then Meg Lanning, another Australian, mm. who's just improving all yeah. the time. Um, Nat Siver, uh, Heather Knight, our England captain. Uh, Sophie Devine at six, who who is just one of the most powerful hitters in the world. And I've never seen someone hit a golf ball as far as she does as well. So um, she won't be happy that she's number six, though. And then I say Catherine Brunt. Mm-hmm. Sophie Eccleston, another England player, uh, left arm spin. Uh, Julian Goswami from India. Um, again, she was probably like a, a Glenn McGrath just on the spot. Uh, and Catherine Fitzpatrick, who I spoke about the quick bowler um so we haven't got many spinners so heather knight will be bowling a lot of her off spin uh, at times but um yeah and and to be fair i remember you saying about the the 11 we played um i played in the rest of the world game at lords mm-hmm. oh my gosh it was just horrible so you get one player out and then it's like meg lanning's coming down the stairs it's like sometimes you, you just don't want to get someone out because then someone else is ridiculously good so um but, yeah, it, that was an experience. It's a shame that they don't do more of the rest of the World Games, because I know they've done it um, a lot more frequently before, but not anymore. I yeah, I, I don't know if it just won't fit in, in, in the schedules now with IPL and, and Big Bash and everything else. So. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you very much for your time, Jenny. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're definitely one of the greatest of all times in the female game with everything that you've won and what you've achieved and all the, how you've changed your action as a professor, I think it's outstanding. So thank you so much. And I wish you all the very best for Christmas and I wish you a happy new year as well. No, thank you. Thank you for inviting me.